And Adrian, thanks for having us at the 90 in your, your, your home institution here. Of course. This and, is a beautiful uh, venue. You know, I have to first say, I appreciate you talking about the, uh, this being an intimate space and, and that that's the reason we're here as opposed to the, the, the Hanauer brothers not being able to draw, right? <laughs> oh, no. You know. No. I know Nick draws. We haven't had you as, as a, at a bigger event, but Nick draws. Yeah. Nick actually yeah, did spoke. well on a flatbed draws, draws a crowd. <laughs> Nick, Doesn't mean Nick, it's good. Nick, you were at the GeekWire Summit in 2015, and I actually went back and just listened to that conversation that, that we had. And it was, it was one of, actually, frankly, I'm not just blowing smoke here. It was one of the highest rated uh, conversations that we've had at the GeekWire Summit. So, no, we just like to have small, intimate conversations where we can go much deeper here. So, um, I think it's really cool um, that I get to sit down with uh, two brothers. I come from a family with, with, with two brothers, and so I feel like I have this kindred spirit. My brother Dave is here in the audience tonight. We promised we weren't gonna have a cook hand our face off. Um, but, you know, I think it's really interesting to have two brothers that have taken divergent paths, uh, but have really been engaged in the community in so, in so many different ways, and I think that's just really unique. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, and. To start off, I just wanted to ask you the question of, you know, you're in different spheres, you're involved in different things, different interests, but I'm sure there's some business advice or lessons that you share amongst each other. And I just want to ask you, what's that, what, what is that business lesson or advice, Adrian, that you've taken from Nick or Nick, you've taken from Adrian? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, Nick's older, uh, so I, I've, I've wiser, gotten to a, yeah, or not wiser. Wiser. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I would I would say, look, we we have not necessarily had one of those relationships where we give each other advice and and uh, um, y you know sort of nurture each other, um, but it's all through observation. You know, we grew up uh, in the family business, uh, and I got to you know I was the younger brother. I got to observe him. Uh, as he went about his business and, and, you know, there was always this good sort of gap of age and I was able to, to see him evolve and, and try to emulate some of what he did. I know it's very hard to believe, but Adrian is six years younger than me. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, again, and, and I know we'll get into it, but, you know, they're just sort of those character traits that you, that you see in, in family at all, you know, again, it started through our parents, but, uh, his, his absolute, you know, unending passion for the things that he gets, uh, uh, involved in, his obsession, uh, his, uh, his curiosity, um, his, um, you know, absolute, you know, dog on a bone sort of mentality. Uh, you know, I kind of talk with my friends, like Nick has always been, you know, we can use this, a sports analogy, but kind of a, 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 f a full contact kind of athlete. Uh, you know, we were, we both played a lot of soccer growing up. Nick was a center back um, and looked for contact. Uh, I was a horrible soccer player. <laughs> I mean, to, um, be, to be fair. Uh, and you and, were what? And I was a, I was a, a, a very clever, crafty midfielder who tried to avoid contact at all, you know, at all turns. Uh, and, you know, our, our lives to some degree kind of, you know, I can give you other analogies, but, you know, um, as we get into it, you know, Nick is definitely, you know, out there as a, as a full contact participant in, in everything he does. Yeah. And I'm, um, you know, a little lower profile. So although... We have a lot of common traits. I think we're, you know, we are completely different people. Yeah, and, but, you know, I am definitely more overtly aggressive than Adrian, but not more obsessive compulsive. <laughs> uh, so, but for sure, I am obsessive. I'm not OCD, but I am maniacally focused. But Adrian is no less maniacally focused on the stuff that he cares about. And whether it's his businesses like the Sounders or his various passions like tennis or poker, or whatever, whatever it is at the moment, for sure we go deep and hard. Um, um, and, you know, I think that Adrian is different than me. And, you know, one of the things that 
I think makes Adrian super successful in the businesses in which he's found himself, particularly professional sports, is he's not a dick, right? He's not an egomaniac, a self-aggrandizing egomaniac, which in that business is super rare. Right, and if you are not a self-aggrandizing egomaniac, it gives you a massive advantage, because you're not antagonizing everybody all the time and doing damage control all the time. And so, and that, you know, that has served him super duper well. Uh, it, you know, like maybe it is the dribbling versus smashing down, but it, it just, um, it, it definitely has worked. So the trait you admire in him. Is or the lesson you've learned is don't be a, as much. Don't of a dick. be an asshole. Don't be an asshole. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Because it works apparently. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> yeah, but definitely. I mean, yeah, super relentless, but not, but not self-aggrandizing. And I do a lot of stuff to be clear. That is deliberately self-aggrandizing, in my political work because that's how you have to move the ball. And I'm, you know, like it drives my wife crazy and stuff like that. It's just something that I'm suited for and can do and sometimes enjoy. But, you know, there are massive downsides to that form of behavior that, yeah. you know, Adrian doesn't have. Sure. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, staying in the family, um, you know, let's face it. You guys were born on third base. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys grew up here in Seattle. Nick, Nick would say he was born on second base, and I was born on third okay. base. Yeah, so I think the business had succeeded. I, yeah, in that, in that six year period. Yeah, 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 we're not. We were not born quite on third base. I'm surrounded by kids who were actually born on third base. The kids who grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut, and went to Andover, and then scratched their way from Andover to Harvard. Those guys were born on third base. We we grew up super middle class went to public schools and, you know, eventually our, you know, our dad became successful as we grew up. But to be absolutely clear, we grew up with massive advantages over the typical person, most particularly because our, you know, we had a really good family and our parents were super supportive and we learned a lot of lessons about how to make our way in the world from our dad from our dad in particular and mom and stuff like that that other people just didn't get, so. Yeah, I mean, Nick, you were quoted, I think it was in the TED Talk, you said if you were born in another society without the luck of your birth, you would just be some dude standing barefoot by the side of the road selling fruit. Yeah, because so. that's, that's what the great entrepreneurs in the Congo do, right? Because that's all that's available to do. Um, here in our society, you know, we, we, we tend to want to believe that our success is a consequence of our own efforts individually, and that's just that's just objectively false, that we are all products of our circumstances. We benefit from the things that have come before us. The networks that we are part of um, are what enable our success. And if you live in the United States of America, you can become like successful in the way that we have become. And if you live in other places, standing by the side of a road, Barefoot selling fruit is is a, is is a is a significant similar achievement. Yeah. Even still, whether it was second or third base, uh, you grew up with a lot of advantage uh, compared to most, and you grew up in a family where entrepreneurship was part of the DNA. Um, you know, I'm the thing that's kind of struck me is there are a lot of people that are born into those circumstances that uh, don't progress after. Uh, you know, being the trust fund kid from Greenwich, Connecticut or what have you. They're locked into that lifestyle. And the thing that's always impressed me about the two of you is that you didn't stop. You, I mean, really, if you look at it, I would imagine that you are enormously more successful and more wealthy now than, than uh, you were growing up in the, the family business based on the various pursuits that you've, you've taken. And I guess I want to dig into that just a little bit about, like, why did you do that? What's, what's the drive that caused you to do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start. You know, and, and again, you, you kind of mentioned it. Like, there really wasn't an option for us. Like, again, we feel like we had, we feel like we were born on second base. Like, we had a huge advantage. But it wasn't that we had giant trust funds. It was that our or parents. any trust funds. Or any yeah. trust yeah. funds. 
our parents valued education, they valued teaching us, they taught us really good lessons. We grew up in a family business where all we did was talk about uh, business and, and, uh, and the struggles of business, you know, the, the, my father year after year saying we are nev we're not going to make it through the next two months, we're yeah. not going to make payroll. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure, deep in both of our psyches is scarring from the way yeah. in which our dad ran the family business. Yeah. As he ran it to the ragged edge, we were always on the brink of bankruptcy. This was something he, he loved to share with the entire family that we were almost certainly going to all be poor and have to be homeless he next month. thrived on the, on yeah. the drama. And it, the, yeah, the it was brutal, brutal. And so I think both of us came out in the world and we're like, fuck that. You know, like, we, yeah. we got we to get, like, we have to get secure. So we grew up somewhat... We weren't economically insecure, but we probably felt more economically insecure than we were. And and, and I also think that those, you know, look, I, I think the formative years for us were those early years. I mean, way earlier for him than, well, six years earlier than, yeah. but, you know, again, when, when we were 12, 13, okay, we moved to Mercer Island. We had a, had a house on the water. It was I a was little, 18. He was gone. But I was already formed. But yeah. I was already, like, we were already working. I was already even working at the family business two years prior to that, doing whatever crappy jobs we could for minimum wage if we were lucky. Um, so a lot of those, I think, early lessons were already, were already ingrained. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, look, I, I um, you know, maybe more so me than, than him. I, you know, I, I like, I, I had a rough sort of, finding my way. I mean, I, I, you know, definitely I have not succeeded in everything I've touched. I've had plenty of failures. I should have invested in GeekWire. Um, <laughs> Would have been the biggest success yet, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, um, but again, you know, I, I, I have a, you know, pretty, I'm pretty, uh, um, again, compulsive and, and competitive and um, disciplined and, um, uh, you know, I will stick with it. So, you know, again, maybe a slightly different, you know, thing because I think Nick has, Nick has evolved a, uh, probably a greater, um, tolerance for, for risk and taking massive swings. Um, uh, I, my guess is that I'm a little more, um, uh, patient. You know, I have a, I have a, chain of picture framing stores that, you know, we started and he cut the cord on 20 years ago. And I, you know, I've had it for 30 years now. I think he would slit his wrists if he was involved with something that, yeah. for that long. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I've been, I've been toiling away at the Sounders thing now for 17 years. I mean, full time. Um, I, you know, another one that like, I'm a, I like to play uh, 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 tournament no limit hold 'em poker, which, you know, can last a week sitting at a sitting at a table and again he would like One fifteen hour. minutes and yeah, he's out. So okay. yeah. um, are there any lessons from poker that you've applied to business? For sure. I mean I think I think poker is a fantastic game for for people to learn and, and I and, would agree. Yeah. I it's mean one of the great you can learn almost everything you need to learn about strategy playing good Texas no limit. Hold yeah. On. Discipline, patience, uh, pot odds, reading. With, with, Nick, with Nick, it's all in, right? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm actually a really wimpy poker player. Yeah. Cool. Um, I asked you at the start just kind of about the traits and common characteristics, but as brothers, you know, I have to think that there are things that annoy you about one another. What is the trait that you don't like about one another that bothers you? Oh, you know, look, um, oh, you know, the only one, and, and it's not that it bothers me. I, you know, it worries me. He is, he can be bombastic and out there. And it worries me um, because 
you know, he's he's waded in so, to some pretty meaty issues, um, uh, and uh, y you know, ha there are a lot of people who dislike what he says, and and you know, it just worries me about him uh, and and how bombastic and and aggressive he can be. I understand it's you know, it's the way he has to sort of move the needle at times, but uh, you know, that that definitely you know concerns me. Yeah, my, my wife shares that. She, she hates the death threats, oddly. Um, uh, yeah, I, that's a good question. I mean, if you had asked me when I was 12, I could have gone on for an hour. <laughs> I, I just, I don't know. Uh, just, what's annoying? I, I don't know. I, I, I just, I don't know. I can't, I can't successfully well, answer I, that I question. I used to be late. More and he used to, have, yeah. Okay. You did? Yeah. He used to little. cry a lot when he was a little <laughs> kid. Hey, I was the youngest cried brother too. That was that's a defense mechanism. I remember that. I, I was I know, super I know annoying. He's yes. so always crying. Well, well, how about this, uh, Nick? You, in fact, when I mentioned the GeekWire Summit interview in 2015, and I just went back and listened to the funny thing about that was you were talking about your 15-year-old, I think, son at the time, who you were so fearful of that you were going to give the car keys over to. And he was just getting his license. And um, it was this point about AI and self-driving cars. Um, we maybe talk about that a little bit later. But Adrian, you have a new baby. I'm curious if you have any parental advice for Adrian. Oh, golly. Uh, she's that I haven't given already. Adrian's kid's really super cute. Uh, for a, a parenting advice, geez, uh, have fun. You, you know, our dad was a great dad, but he was a drag, right? He went out of his way to be like not fun to hang around with. I, you know, like it was the old fashioned parenting model, right? Like he wasn't mean to us. He just wasn't like. You would be like, Dad, let's go do something fun. No, let's read a book no, on the No, the business is collapsing. Yes, I can't yeah, get out. Yes, exactly, right? And he was like, well, okay, you can go through your life like that, but I think you've optimized for the wrong things. So, you know, be fun to be with. Now, the, uh, but I, I don't need to give him that advice because I observe he is fun to be with and he spends a lot of time with his kids. So. And look, my, you, my challenge and, and the thing I'll lean on him for, which I don't know, I mean, I know ways that, that I can manage around this, but again... Uh, my son is going to grow up on, for sure on third base. And so, yeah. like a lot of people, you know, how do you keep a kid grounded? How do you teach those great values? How do you, you know, make him not believe that he's growing up He deserves up on all that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, we have a lot of startup founders in the room. So let's talk a little bit about startups. Uh, you mentioned failure. Adrian, you've had a lot of failures. Um, failure is part of sports. Uh, certainly, so you deal with failure a lot. Nick, failure is part of I, one of the things that stood out to me from that GeekWire Summit interview was you were talking about the failures around gun control, an issue that's very uh, that you're very passionate about, and we certainly have continued to see failures in that regard. How how have you both been able to cope with failure in your lives? Because that's something every entrepreneur in here is is dealing with. You know. I think, you know, I'm not even sure. So failure is a word that's used in our language, but that certain people just don't process in the way that the word is meant. You know, like... And certainly we grew up, our dad modeled behavior, which was that life is full of setbacks, but very few real failures. You know, like, uh, and, you know, expecting, set, you know, expecting setbacks and working through setbacks, which are an inevitable part of the dynamics of any complicated project or process. And, you know, keeping your eye on the prize, being able to adjust to changing circumstances, 
understanding when to press, when understanding when to, you know, fall back a little bit are all ingredients for how you move forward in any endeavor and under any circumstance. And, you know, so if you're an entrepreneur, you are going to have a lot of setbacks, right? Like there are no circumstances in which there are not a lot of setbacks in that, in that domain. And if you're an investor, you're going to have a lot of crappy investments, right? Like you just are. And you just have to understand. I don't know. I don't even like people talk about failure. I just don't even, I don't know. I just like, okay, next, you know, like, right. Yeah. Uh, maybe not quite like that. <laughs> yeah, I just, I mean, yeah. but this is, this is how we're different. Yeah. You know, like yeah. he, Nick has always been able to compartmentalize in a way that, that, that yeah. I can't. Like when it's over, it's over. And you're just like, next thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Oops. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, for sure, I, you know, I have a piece of that, but, um, but, you know, for me, you know, I would call it, it setbacks, but I've, you know, it's taken me a long time to get to a point in my life where I can live with setback and, and can spin it and take the positive angle on it. You know, like some early setbacks um, felt like failures and, you know, in my, in my uh, early days and, and, you know, I have a super, highly successful, high-functioning brother who I looked up to and when, you know, when I was not performing to, you know, his level, I, you know, I, I have yeah. the same psycho, you know, psychoanalytical psycho-anal- challenges that, that, you know, any f- family dynamic has. So. Yeah, and I, I was not burdened by that, right? Because it helps to go first in these circumstances. So I don't have to... No, honestly, right? Like, you just don't have to look up to somebody and... Um, and, and th- you know, and then, you know, I think that, that, that for me, the important sort of transformation was, you know, as I became more of a, a leader in my organizations and, and the community, uh, realizing that, that failure is not really an option or certainly like y- you need to be there for the, the, the rest of the organization and, um, and turn failures into opportunities or setbacks into opportunities. And so, you know, look with the current sounders, right? I mean, this, this, I was going to you- ask about the letter you sent out to me as a season ticket holder, apologizing for the season. Yeah, I mean, look, and and that's kind of, you know... Let's turn it around tonight with the watch party because we're going to get a win, right? Let's hope so. Uh, No, but that that is, you know, for me, how how I've dealt with some setbacks is acknowledging them. Like, you know, things... Things happen. They don't always happen according to to, uh, uh, plan A. Uh, uh, You know, there's a really good guy in our... in the sports industry... Um, who brokers a lot of a lot of sports franchises and and you know one of his famous you know quotes that's attributed to him is s- something to the effect of you know plan A is easy uh, good organizations are able to pivot and and have a good plan B uh, especially in sports because you know on any given day half the teams are going to lose and. And two thirds of the teams are going to miss the playoffs, and and uh, so. Well, but Femi Martins is going to go to China. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Jordan Jordan's going to you know have an injury. Anyway, yeah, there's Sounders fans in here. They get they get the jokes. Um, <laughs> Nick, um, is there an example of a failure that you've encountered that you really learned a lesson from that you could share with us? Uh, one of my favorite failures was my, I think it was, it was either $150,000 or $250,000 investment in Pets.com 60 days before it went, the puppet. yeah, the puppet, yep. sock puppet, <laughs> Pets.com 60 days before it went, bro, uh, went public. And like, okay, so there were all sorts of things about that taught me a lesson. So A, why in the world would the chief financial officer of Pets.com need my $250,000 60 days before they were going to go public? 
you know, a reasonable person would ask very, a lot of questions around that. And two, in the day, pets.com was the dumbest idea ever. I mean, it just, there was no way in those days that thing was going to work. And I was just pretty sure about that, but I thought, well, what the heck, you know, it's going to go public and it's going to trade for a million zillion dollars and we're going to make all this money. And, you know, like in five minutes, as my partner Mike Slade, that the, tra the stock was trading for drill bits, what do you call it, drill bits, which is seven eighths or four fifths or like, <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it, like it was literally like four fifths of a penny or something like that. And we lost all our money in like 200 days. Anyway, it was just, it was just an act of investing hubris that was just, when I look back on it, it was just shocking, right? Like, why do you need me and why now and by the way it's a business going nowhere and all of these questions I should ask myself you know like like it was just stupid on so many levels um, any one of which was disqualifying but you know I was stupid and short-sighted and greedy and got rewarded for that and I have one thing to show for that investment is I still have the sock puppet <laughs> you remember that stupid thing it's all that is left of pets.com is, is the sock puppet. I keep it proudly in my office on my shelf to remind me. Well, I think that model eventually ended up working out. What it was did. It, it did. Mark Fadon, company, Choosy. Or, 15 or years it? later, when yeah, everyone was, bought yeah. everyone, everything on the internet, it was, it was viable. But, when, you know, but, but you know, those were in Amazon.com days when people yeah. were still like, oh, I'm not going to use my credit card in the internet. You know, so right. there's right. No, no way it was going to work. Um, are there any entrepreneurs from which you draw inspiration or that have um, really inspired you? I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, you know, I um, especially, you know, I've sort of slowed down the, the, the tech investing. I'm really not doing a lot of, uh, a lot of that. Um, and I'm, you know, I, I like... It's a bubble right now, so good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I like uh, observing, you know, some of the, the people operating big, big businesses and seeing the way uh, they're able to um, maintain, grow. I mean, what Satya has done at Microsoft, um, watching Dara, uh, Dara Khosrow at, at Uber, at Uber. Yep. Um, at first at Expedia and then at, at, at Uber, you know, obviously the, 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 the multi multiple successes of, of the Rich Barton, Lloyd Frank combo. Um, uh, so, but I, I, I think it's just really fascinating to see how someone takes a giant organization and can, and can you know, re-inject it with life and, and turn it, uh, you know, turn it in a different direction. Because uh, I think that's harder than, uh, than you know, a startup. What yeah, about you, I mean, you know, definitely as an entrepreneur, you know, for sure, I mean, Jeff Bezos is for sure the smartest person I've ever, I've ever worked directly with. Um, he, you know, he is a remarkable entrepreneur. I wouldn't say I'm a great fan of his moral reasoning, but, um, uh, but, uh, he, but he, um, but he's an extraordinary, you know, commercial entrepreneur and, you know, just a deeply insightful and strategic thinker. Um, you know, my best buddy, Rich Barton, is, you know, just a terrific, amazing entrepreneur. And, you know, you tend to admire the people that you're close to and that you get to watch carefully. Um, I have definitely pivoted hard away from admiration for people who just make a lot of money and towards people who make the world a better place. And so my, the way in which I process who I respect and admire has changed, you know, dramatically over the last 10 years. So it's, it's funny you mentioned Rich Barton because uh, the f uh, co-founder of Expedia and Zillow, because I reached out to him because I know you're both friends with him and asked him what I should ask you guys. Ah. <laughs> and so... Um, 
you know, he told me to dig deep on Burning Man, Nick. <laughs> Go real deep. What goes on down there? Really, what's going on down there? That's so funny. <laughs> Yeah, Adrian doesn't go to Burning Man, but my wife and I do go to Burning Man with Rich, with Rich and his wife. So Yes, I, I don't think those stories are going to get told here tonight. Uh, but he did, um, he did offer a couple questions, and one was um, you know, kind of switching gears into kind of civic, uh, the civic engagement. Um, uh, he asked, you know, and he said, you know, a lot of people in your position right now would be on a golf course or out on your yacht, um, you are out there being bombastic. Tomorrow, they'll be there. <laughs> okay, well, still doing some other things too. Um, why do you? Why do you get out there in the community in the way that you do around some of these issues that you're taking on, whether it's gun control or fifteen dollar minimum wage or uh, hollowing out of the middle class? Why? Why are these things that you do when you? Don't have to. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, something I'm frequently asked, and it's a psychological question that I'm not like. I just allow for the possibility that I'm not probably the best person to ask. You probably ask, ask my Adrian. mom. <laughs> but uh, but I think you know. Uh, I mean, for sure, it, it's some combination of uh, you know a moral sense of responsibility. That's a that's a bit of it, not all of it. There's some part of it which is uh, that, uh, you know, I have an insatiable appetite for challenge and stimulation. And, you know, like, I just have to be working on something. Uh, and, and, um, and I find that, and with all due respect to everybody in the room who, who, who is involved in commercial things, what you learn when you go into the civic space is that business problems are simple problems. They're engineering problems. They're, they're relatively narrowly defined. The metrics are clear. The constraints are obvious. In the civic world, the problems are infinitely more complex. I just find it more interesting. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, it's so frustrating. Yeah, that frustration you feel is the, is the feeling the brain makes when it comes up against actually hard problems, right? And so I find it just in, enormously satisfying. And, and then the third component for sure is straight up ego and ambition. It is fun to drive social change. It's just like, it's just like, it's like winning a soccer game. I mean, you, you piss a lot of people off, but it is deeply satisfying to, to like raise the minimum wage from $9 to $15 for millions of people, right? Like, it is just deeply satisfying. And it's uh, satisfying to the ego. I'll, I'll add one more to, to his list, which is that he is, I mean, unbelievably creative, uh, open-minded, and absolutely has no connection to the herd. You know, like, he's uniquely, his mind is uniquely suited and designed to think outside the box and 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 deal with some of these complex solutions um y you know in a way again I, I just you know i'm always um blown away by um his problem solving and and um and the logic that you know that comes from this uh really deep thinking yeah it, and I, I would say that there's this psychological peculiarity of me, which is, that Adrian is touching on, which is a complete, like, human beings were evolved and were socialized to, to sort of go with the flow, to like things other people like, to do things other people do, to believe things other people believe, to go to sporting events and be part of the crowd. I didn't get that gene. Like, I just didn't get it. And so I am super comfortable being the only person in a room to believe one thing and everybody believes another. This is not, like, I just got born with that. I just I, I, we drove my teachers crazy when I was younger. I was a bane to my parents. Like, I just didn't need to do what other people did or thought. 
And that frees you. I don't think I'm more creative, but it frees you to not just to not think what other people think. And that's the definition of, do you know what I mean? Like, it's just like, oh, I, I don't care what you think. I think this thing. And then you get to think different things, and some of those things are valid and important and useful. Does that make sense? And it really was. Like, he, he was born with this. Like, <laughs> you know. Tell a go, story. No, I mean, like, he, he was one of those kids, had the room in the basement that was, like, for sure off limits. Um, you know, you went in, and there would At be. At your peril. Yeah, there was some exactly. crazy Reptiles, shit going Reptiles, there were, you know, stuffed animals used as experiments for various things, lots of explosives, yeah. you know, it was, it was scary for our parents. Yeah. Right. yeah, I was probably not an easy child to raise. And you are still uh, not an easy person to harness, uh, and... Um, I wanted to share a few, I mean, we've written about Nick and his pursuits over, over the years, and each time uh, the reaction uh, is, is quite interesting, which makes it great content for us. I just wanted to share a few of the comments so you get a sense of how people sometimes feel about Nick. Um, Hanauer is an out-of-touch elitist who can't understand why Trump was elected. This is a com these are all comments in the GeekWire comment thread. It's Monday and GeekWire must need clicks. And other news, Nick is still a world-class jerk. Uh, <laughs> typical idiot, idiocy from this moron. Dear GeekWire, we are so sick of this guy. Please, GeekWire, do not give this buffoon any more free PR. So well, some of this you, comes you with... You cut out the, the harsh ones. Yeah, there's, I, I, I tried to keep it. Oh, <laughs> Those are the nice fa ones. Fa family audience yeah. here, you know, you know, we're on video. So, I mean, you said that... Um, the, the criticism, you're, you're willing to take it, and it comes up. But at some point, this has an impact in terms of uh, the perception and, and being the outlier. How do you deal with all that, that criticism? Well, a lot of your friends in the same social yeah, circles probably don't believe Are the ones do. posting those yeah, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, all my friends. Um, so, you know... Civic and social change, you know, civic and social change are about creating friction. Uh, I mean, if you want to bend the arc of history towards justice, you are going to antagonize some people. <laughs> you just are. Mostly rich people, it turns out. <laughs> and, uh, and that is in the nature of the thing and, uh, you know, I know it may not seem like it, but I think very carefully about what I engage in. The things that we commit ourselves to, and by we I mean my team at Civic Ventures and the people I collaborate with, feel very strongly that we are taking majoritarian positions. That is to say, we, are do we will never do something that we don't think benefits most people over the long term. Um, uh, and um, acknowledge that whenever you try to change a system or a society or a culture or a set of beliefs, a lot of people are going to be super antagonized by that. And the better you are at it, the more antagonized certain kind of people will become. And that, you know, that, that if you, look, if you want to accomplish a lot in the world, you are you are just likely going to antagonize people. It's just it's just part of the game, and I accept that a lot of people are angered by some of the some of the things that we do, and I feel bad about it a little, kind of, sort of. But um, it just is it just is it's the pr it's the price you pay for animating change, and that's it. So you guys are both rooted in Seattle. You grew up here. Uh, you're part of this community, part of the business community, part of the civic community. Um, Nick, you've talked about how if we continue to see this hollowing out of the middle class and the changes that are happening and really the changes that you see on the streets of Seattle, I mean, it's, it's just so apparent that the pitchforks, you have a famous TED talk where you talk about the pitchforks are going to come out. Um, this was something you said back in 2015 or so, I think, 14. in 20, 2014. Are the pitchforks here? Yeah, for sure. And the pitchforks aren't just, they're, they're here in Seattle, they're here nationally, and they're here 
in almost all of the, well, not all of the developing countries, but they're here around the world. And that is because the last 40 years um, uh, in, in the developing world were sort of possessed by a bunch of, you know, I mean, you can characterize these ideas in a variety of ways, but neoliberalism is one that, you know, is, you know, we, what we did is we enacted a set of policies both here in the country and around the developing world that enriched the few and, and immiserated the many. And there, there are almost no, I think there are literally no countries in the world, it, no developed countries in the world today where wealth isn't concentrating at the top. Now, it's a particularly egregious in the United States, which is an outlier on that. But the, but the, but the, the problem is, is that this, you know, this, there's, and there's an overwhelming amount of social science to, to um, validate this. It, it, you know, it, 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 rising economic inequality in a commercial society shreds the reciprocity norms that make social cohesion and hence democracy possible. And if you create a society in which structurally impoverishes most people and systematically um, enriches a few, you know, you're gonna, it, it is not gonna end well. And yeah. so the political polarization that we see in our society, um, the authoritarianism that's coming out, these are the inevitable consequences of building a society that serves the few and not the many. And, and you know, and there is, there's no political process. So there, there, there's not a new set of political leaders that can, that can resolve that problem. You actually have to begin to materially improve the lives of the median family. And in the absence of that, things are gonna get much worse before they get better. And in Seattle, we see this, uh, and I think you look at a company like Amazon that has just completely mushroomed here and really changed the climate of the community uh, really almost overnight. Uh, and I think there's a lot of those pitchforks. You see it uh, throughout the community rising up against a company like Amazon, which you mentioned Bezos, maybe he hasn't done enough to participate in the civic life of, of the community. Um, I want to kind of advance that a, a bit what advice would you give to the HQ2 city that Amazon's going to potentially locate in before they arrive? And Adrian, you can weigh in as well. No. <laughs> well, he just well, wants I mean, to get at the soccer questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah you, you just have to, so, so look, economic growth is, is, is a good thing, but it's not an unalloyed good. Um, particularly if the economic growth is not broadly shared. And, um, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm a hardcore capitalist. I believe, in, I believe in entrepreneurship, and I'm super happy to have lots of companies here that are building uh, great products and hiring lots of people and stuff like that. But you just have to, you just have to be grown up enough to acknowledge that there will be a downside in a city if you bring a whole bunch of people to it very, very quickly and make a few people wealthy while leaving a bunch of other people behind. And one of the things that you will get from that is homelessness, which is an epidemic in our city and every fast growing city in America, right? It just, like, this isn't a Seattle problem, this is a problem which is, a, which, is which characterizes every single fast growing city in America and more and more around the world. And, and that's because if you, if you turn $500 apartments into $2,500 apartments, none of the people who are at the bottom of the spectrum can afford to live anymore, right? Like it's not, it's pretty simple math. And, and so as a society and as business leaders, we have, I think, a responsibility to acknowledge the downsides of the upsides, right? Like it's awesome that Amazon's here and we ne also need to find a way to take care of the people who have been left behind. And, and so if I was HQ2 City, I would wanna be sure that I had mechanisms in place to, to ensure that the, gr that the growth and the benefits 
we're not overwhelmed by the social problems created by that inevitable growth, right? Like if you double the price of housing in a place, that's going to create a problem, <laughs> right? It just is going to be create a problem. So how do you deal with that? You'd love to have that figured out before you double the price of the housing, not after, which is what we're dealing with. Well, I want to open it up quickly for uh, a couple audience questions. want to allow you in the audience to ask a question or two. Um, I do have soccer questions, so we'll take a couple audience questions before we jump, because you know we're going to watch the match tonight, right? We got the San Jose Earthquakes uh, Sounders game, must win game. So we'll lead into that game with a couple Sounders questions. But uh, yeah, got a question right up front. I think you're close enough, I can give you the mic. Okay. Oh, wow. It's just a follow up to what you just asked or asked next. So policy platform things for 2020, what do you think we need to do about the problems of inequality? What, what do you think should be on the platform for a 2020 election? Yeah, so what, what the question was, if you didn't hear, what should be on the platform for the 2020 election? And I, you know, I'm not gonna give a long answer, but in round numbers, out of a, out of a $18 trillion economy, over the last 40 years, an incremental two to three trillion dollars per year is flowing to the top 1% of earners that used to flow to ordinary Americans. So if you had held, so the, or the, the median family in America earns $59,000 a year. If you had held that family harmless to inequality increases, over the last 30 years, they would earn 86,000. If uh, the median family had part fully participated in productivity growth over the last 30 or 40 years, they would earn over $100,000 a year. What that means is fact effectively is that the country owes the median family a raise of between 25 and $40,000 a year. And in the absence of a set of policies that get that address the problem at the scale, at that scale, at the, the scale of the problem, you are unlikely to heal the divisions in our society. Because that's how far behind the typical family in our country feels they've, you know, gone, right, versus the top. And so, you know, the specifics are complicated, but at the, at the high level, that is the scale of the, pro of the challenge that the nation faces. And it, and, and it is not something that you're hearing a lot of people talk about. There's a question in the back. I think you just speak up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I uh, honestly, I'm not sure that either of us are perfectly suited to, to that, uh, to, to deal with that question, because honestly, setback was a setback for us. Yeah, you know, we right. had, we had a safety net, yeah. which allowed us to take more risk. Uh, we had networks that allowed us to access, you know, resources to, uh, to, to start our companies. Um, uh, you know, and and my guess is that you're doing, you know, that 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 hunger <laughs> and that you know where you've come from is gonna allow you to be successful because you're gonna, you know, y y there is no alternative uh, uh, to failure, and and so, um, you know, 
the fact that you're here, that, you know, my guess is that, that you're doing a lot of the right things. Um, uh, but again, I'm not sure, you know, we're the, we're the exact right ones to answer the question. Yeah, and the fact is that opportunity is not equally distributed in the country. And that, the, and that, and that the people who are most successful in our country today are in most cases people who started on third base. Jeff Bezos, third base. Bill Gates, third base. Steve Ballmer, third base. Uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, third base. I mean, these are all people who started out with massive advantages, massive advantages, and turned those advantages into what's, what's a word bigger than massive? I don't know, but you know, like. And, Extremely and, massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, one more. Yep. Yeah, so, so, um, so, what I, so, you know, I think you're right on all three counts, uh, and it is hard to get people to look up from their projects and be more expansive in their view. Um, and, uh, you know, like I, I spent a lot of, a big part of my day doing exactly the same thing. Um, and, uh, and people often, I, you know, push back on my stuff saying, well, you know, if you feel so, so strongly about it, why don't you just pay more taxes or whatever, the usual stupid shit that people say. And, and my rejoinder is, is because that's just not how human societies work and most of us need to be required to do the right thing, uh, which is why we have, which, which is why coaches have teams <laughs> and, and, and students have teachers and, and uh, uh, companies have CEOs and armies have generals and and countries have uh, laws and governments. And, and so, you know, I think at the end of the day, we, you know, we need to collectively require better behavior from, our, from ourselves and our citizens. And, um, and uh, I don't think that the leadership to get those things done will likely come from the people who are not doing it today. Uh, and, and so, you know, I just don't have any problem imposing standards on people to be better, uh, uh, which is where, which is ultimately where, where scaled social change comes from. So, well, you know, I'll just add that, that it's been interesting for me to see the evolution since, I mean, he, you know, Nick's been talking about this for 10 years longer, uh, and you know, for for me, you know, those early conversations, people would look sideways at him like, you know, like he had three eyes. Um, and it's amazing how people have come around. Uh, and, uh, you know, they may come around too little too late, um, but uh, people are starting to realize that, that the challenges we have are real. So before we, I know we have a few more questions, but I think we want to transition to the watch party here. Before we do that, I want to ask Adrian a, a soccer uh, question. Um, you know, the Sounders have been enormously su successful going towards 10 years here now. Uh, I think it's probably exceeded your expectations by, by almost every measure. Um, but now as you kind of go into that middle age of the organization, how are you trying to keep the entrepreneurial enthusiasm alive and thriving? Because that becomes a challenge for all companies that get to a certain age. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a it's a great question. Um, uh, obviously, you know, number one is surrounding myself with really good people who you know come from different different walks of life, different industries, different uh, sports experiences to to make sure that we can manufacture some of that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, the second thing is that there are, you know, we get to, in sports, we get to look at 
new examples all the time and, and see who's doing things, uh, doing things well. Uh, when we came into MLS 10 years ago, we were, you know, we were the shining star. Uh, uh, the commissioner of the NBA called it the greatest sports uh, franchise launch uh, in the history of professional sports. Uh, but, you know, there's a, we have a team in Atlanta now uh, that, that 70, started last people. year. Yeah, yeah. 73,000 people last week uh, at our game there. Uh, and it's a it's Arthur Blank owned who started uh, Home Depot and and owns the Atlanta Falcons, and you know they've taken it to another level. Uh, so we're you know we're able to observe what people are doing uh, to to move you know, take the take the bar even higher. Um, but it is you know it it's hard and I'll you know I'll I'll go. Um, you know, one of our challenges is to continue to bring people into the system. Uh, youth soccer, uh, you and I have talked about it in the past, that, that youth soccer involvement is, is uh, flat at, at best right now. A lot of sports losing, uh, losing participation. Um, uh, uh, more so, quite frankly, in some of the other sports, football, uh, baseball, basketball. But it does, you know, it ties a little bit into this, into this civic conversation because uh, one of the big reasons kids are dropping out is, is, it's, is it's expensive uh, to play organized sports these days. Uh, and especially in, uh, you know, underserved communities, minority communities, kids just can't do it. Uh, you know, their families have... Two jo they, you know, parents each have two jobs. There's not a lot of time to drive, you know, the kids around to, to soccer practice and and uh, or to or to fly to California. Yeah, right. Yeah, or to or to spend, you know, four thousand dollars a year to, you know, keep your kids in yeah. in soccer. So, um, you know, one of the things that we've done is uh, we've started a, a a foundation called the Rave Foundation. Uh, and we're out building mini soccer fields in, in underserved communities uh, for free play. One, one of the, uh, just a quick story and the reason this foundation uh, um, uh, evolved is uh, I was in a meeting of uh, ethnic communities, underserved communities, talking about soccer, access to soccer, ac access to fields, and uh, the story was that these communities would finally get enough money put together to build uh, a field, uh, and then in order to support it, they would have to rent it out, and all of the rich kids from the, you know, from the kids on second and third base would rent these fields in these underserved communities, and the kids in those communities didn't get to use them. So uh, that was kind of the inspiration for, for doing our part to to try to put these fields in inner cities. The first one's going to open uh, in Yesler Terrace um, in August. So, Great. Well, uh, before we wrap up, I know you guys both played sports growing up, and we're talking about sports and business here tonight. So is there one quick lesson you can share about your own sports uh, careers uh, that you've applied to business? What did you learn from sports? Nick, you too. He has a center back, the hard-charging center back. Yeah, I'm just gonna say that sports was not a big influence for me. It just was. It just. It just wasn't. And what's super weird about my personality is I'm completely uncompetitive in sports. Like, you play don't tennis. Play, don't play Adrian in tennis, then. He crush me. Like, I just don't care if I win. Passing a minimum wage thing, I get crazy over that. But like sports, I don't know. The, 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 you remember I was talking about this thing that was missing in my brain like it's the same it, it's the same thing so he learned a lot more about sp from life than sports than I did yeah Adrian one lesson business lesson yeah I mean look I I think I think I learned a lot of business lessons from sports so I you know it's difficult to to bring it down to one but obviously sports is a it's a team it's a team game and uh you know you can't win uh without the you know the weakest link being as strong as possible and and so uh you know trying to build great great teams good communication everybody uh, uh rowing in the same direction you know that's how that's how teams that's how organizations are are successful and what's the prediction for the 
game tonight before okay, we turn no, it on. I can't, I can't do it. Can't do it. Okay. All right. Well, we'll find out here soon enough. Pain. But, yes. That's the prediction. <laughs> uh, Adrian and Nick, thanks so much for being here. Let's hear Thank it for you, John. both of you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, John. Really fun.